I was standing in a desert. The heat was oppressive, almost like a living thing crawling over my skin, and the air was bitterly dry, as if it had long since forgotten the taste of water. A man stood a little way off in the distance, his back towards me. He was dressed in a simple white robe, torn and smeared from his time in the wilderness. His hair was long and flowing where it ran down to his narrow shoulders, and I felt in a way that I knew this man, that I should go to him. I even took a step forward, but I was stopped in my tracks by the gentle sound of weeping. I turned slowly, my eyes widening as I took in the beauty of the angel that sat on a nearby rock, its midnight wings wrapped about its huddled form. Lucifer, I gasped, approaching slowly, the sound of his awful weeping tearing at my heart. Lucifer, I said again, falling onto my knees before him. He looked up at me then, his sapphire blue eyes filled with an agony I could never even dare to comprehend. Best to come away from him, the other man said from over his shoulder. He's failed. He weeps only for himself. I couldn't break him, Lucifer breathed against my face. I offered him the world. Every imaginable delight known to man would have been his if he would only bow down before me, but, but he would not. I don't understand, I said, reaching for him. He would not bow to me, he suddenly screeched, flying to his feet, a hot wind surrounding him as I fell backwards into the sand, desperately trying to scramble away. He stalked towards me, his face a rigor of hate. His once blue eyes, now a bleeding crimson. But you, he hissed, his hate-filled face looming above me. You are mine. I awoke with a scream, my face pressed against the dry, hard pan floor. I sat up quickly, trying to gather my senses. Bad dream? A small voice tittered. I tried to look around, my eyes swimming in and out of focus. There was a sudden sharp pain, and I cried out, snatching my hand away from a small, scuttling scorpion that emerged from a cluster of nearby rocks. Its claws raised, its stinger dripping venom. I hope you're not poisonous, I growled, tempted to stamp the little bastard to death. Always, the scorpion said. Not that such things can affect you, Mr. Davis. <sighs> Lucifer, I sighed leaning back into the shade of a decaying tree. Where am I? Whose body is this? You are in the future. Well, one possible future, he said, scrambling between my legs. There are many timelines, and this is one of those. Timelines, I said, interested now despite myself. There's more than one? Oh, yes, Lucifer replied. I've been the downfall of many. <laughs> This just happens to be one of those. Now tell me, Mr. Davis, how do you like it? I sat up a little higher, trying to get a good look around, but there wasn't much to see. Only gray, shattered ground and a few dead trees. The sun sat high in the sky and shone weakly between thick ash-like clouds. I seemed to be in some kind of basin surrounded by high, shattered cliffs. I think this place has seen better days. At this, Lucifer burst out laughing. You are the master of understatement, Mr. Davis. What happened here? I asked, attempting to raise my feet, but Lucifer scuttled forward, thrusting his venomous stinger into my unprotected thigh. I screamed out and fell backwards, my leg on fire. Thought I would turn up the juice on you, Lucifer chuckled, stinger raised threateningly. You do not stand unless I tell you to stand, Mr. Davis. You don't even shit without my permission. You have asked questions. Now sit down and have the wisdom to listen to the answers. I did as he asked, the pain in my leg already fading. Still, I watched him carefully as he continued. As I was saying, there are multiple timelines, and I've been the downfall of many. This is just such a one. As for what happened here, I caused a little eruption at Yellowstone Park. 
well, actually, a rather huge eruption that wiped out most of the U.S. Oh, it was a sight to behold. Molten lava, great clouds of ash spewed into the atmosphere. But the fun didn't stop there. That eruption set off a chain of events. Worldwide earthquakes and tsunamis that wiped out whole continents. Ever heard of the Pacific Ring of Fire, Mr. Davis? The whole thing went up like a tar barrel. Soon the very sun in the sky was blocked from the sight of men. Millions died of hunger, disease. Resources became scarcer and scarcer, and then... You know what they did? What was left of these raging governments? They started to fight each other, Mr. Davis, over what little resources were left. <laughs> Even I was stunned. I have always hated your kind, but I think when those first nukes began to fly, I fell in love with your race. Even if it was only for a short time. Jesus, I gasped. They really did that to one another, even amongst all that death? They did that? Oh, yes, Lucifer replied. And those that are left scratch a living from this torn and battered earth, a hell of their own making. And the soul you're after is here? In this place? Yes, actually, she is. Her encampment is to the east, but you're going to the west. The body you now inhabit belongs to a hunter from that particular colony. Unfortunately... This time, he didn't quite make it back with his bag of rats and lizards. He stumbled too far into the waste and found himself trapped in a particularly nasty dust storm. And when you know it, <laughs> he fell victim to a certain venomous scorpion that just seemed to be hanging around. How convenient, I sighed. So why am I going to the west if the soul we're after is in the east? Uh, well, because on this occasion, our little Constance will be coming for you. See how easy I've made this little escapade for you? That's her name. Constance? What does she look like? Oh, you'll know her when you see her. In fact, you can hardly miss her! <laughs> he chuckled. Okay. I sighed. Tired of his games. And where's the blade? For a moment he was silent before continuing, and I heard something in his voice that I'd never heard before. Embarrassment. The whole time travel thing could be a little tricky, Mr. Davis. The blade should be right here, but it's not. Whether this is interference from our unknown adversary or just my own miscalculations, I am unsure. But the blade is that way. <laughs> He said, pointing one jagged claw to the west. In the lost city. Don't worry. The colony you're traveling to is on the same path. On the other side. All you need to do is pick up the blade on your way through and don't worry about the radiation. It won't hurt you. Much. Radiation? I stammered. What the hell do you mean, radiation? But I was talking to myself. He had already fled, leaving a rather grumpy-looking scorpion behind which I quickly squashed with a booted heel before standing and rummaging through a nearby dusty bag. Lucifer had been right. The bag contained the loathsome bodies of a few skinny rats and not much else. The only thing of any use was an old battered and cracked compass which I stuffed into my torn jeans. I was also wearing a short jacket patched in various places and a gray scarf wrapped around my neck and lower face to keep the wind at bay. Laying close by was some kind of spear made out of plastic piping and sharpened to a wicked-looking point. I shrugged, and I picked it up. It was no hellbound blade, but it would do in a pinch. Okay, I said, brushing myself off. Let's get this done. The cliffs were further away than I had first thought, and it was growing dark by the time I had reached their base. The night was coming on fast, and the cool air grew colder by the second. I feared that I would have a long climb ahead of me in the dark, but after a little searching, I found a crack in the base of the cliff, just wide enough for me to squeeze through. I wasn't sure if it would lead to the other side, but I was willing to take my chances rather than 
try to scale those crumbling blackened cliffs. Starting in, my back pressed hard against the rock, shuffling slowly through the sky, a starless blackened void above me. Time took on no meaning. It was only the cold rock and the sound of my labored breathing as I fought my way through. At one point, the passage became so narrow that I had to force my way in, tearing the skin from my forehead and back, ripping up my clothes. I was afraid, terribly afraid I would get stuck. Mummified alive, covered in the dust of eons, until I became one with the rock. Still, I forced my way forward, the bones in my skull starting to squeak, until at last I popped free like a cork from a bottle. There I fell to my knees, blood pouring from my face as my body once again began to knit and heal, whether it was fear or just brute exhaustion. I passed out, and I awoke with a rising sun. The first thing I saw was what Lucifer had referred to as the Lost City. If ever a place had been so namely apt, this was it. For the great city before me was indeed lost. The once rearing skyscrapers had crumbled, slumped like skeletal fingers, reaching towards the sky. The roads, from what I could make out of them, were cracked and covered with dying grass, rusting hunks of metal that could have once been cars sat hunched and broken, clinging weeds crawling through their shattered windows and hanging doors, as I drew closer, the air took on a metallic taste, and my skin began to itch and burn, and I believed if I had a Geiger counter in my hand, I would have started to run the other way. Still, I pressed on, wondering what city this had once been and if it really mattered anymore. After all, this world was dead, the remaining denizens clinging to life as tenuous as the surrounding weeds. I passed a park, the rustling swings creaking in the wind, an overturned slide lying like some forgotten relic amongst the tall grass. There were also other things in the grass. Shining bones bleached white over the long decades. I tried hard not to look at those as I moved further into the city, past shattered buildings and crumbling shops. The air was getting thicker and harder to breathe. I looked down at my hand that still clutched the makeshift spear and noticed a small group of sores breaking out across my skin only to heal before breaking out into weeping sores once again. I realized, even with my accelerated healing, I couldn't stay in this place too long. I had been in the city perhaps an hour, wandering aimlessly, not sure what to do or where to go when the attack came. I was just standing at a crumbling intersection, mostly blocked by overturned cars and rusting wreckage. When there was a howling screech to my left, and four men suddenly rushed at me from a darkened doorway. With a cry, I leapt backwards, spear held out before me, unable to believe that anyone could still live in such a state. For the men before me were almost zombie-like in appearance, emaciated, their gray skin covered in running boils, weeping lesions. In their withered hands, they carried an assortment of rusting weapons, and yet still, they seemed imbued with a frightful vitality. Seeing the weapon in my hand, they spread out in a semicircle, hissing and growling at me like feral beasts. One of the men raised an arm and launched a rusting hatchet at my face, which I just managed to avoid by twisting to the side. Enraged that he missed, he howled his frustration and charged me, but I was ready for him. As he came on, I thrust my spear forward, piercing his throat in a bloody welter. He went down hard, dragging the spear from my hands. The other two men, seeing their opportunity, charged forward. A machete sailed through the air, burying deep in my lower ribcage. The two men, thinking perhaps it was all over for me, backed away, but I only grinned at them, wrenching the machete free from my body, already healing the massive wound as they stood there gaping. I brought the machete, whistling down, burying it into one man's skull. The other man turned to flee, but the remaining man, the biggest of the four who had not attacked, thrust the man back towards me. Off balance, he staggered, almost falling, his arms flailing. Seeing my opportunity, I grabbed his arm and span him around, thrusting him into nearby wreckage and twisting metal. It impaled him on a broken grinder that burst from his chest. For a moment, his eyes widened, his blood erupted from his mouth, and then he lay still. Quickly, I turned to the other man who grinned at me, revealing black, shattered teeth. From behind his back, he drew the hellbound blade, but his leer soon turned to grimaces of pain as the blade turned white hot in his hands at my presence. With a scream, he dropped it to the ground, holding his weeping hand before him. 
I dived for the blade, but I was too slow, and he kicked it away from me, leaping onto my back, dragging me down on top of him. His forearm wrapped around my throat. Reaching over my head, I managed to find his face. Groping for his eyes, I thrust my fingers deep into the socket. He howled in pain, loosening his grip, giving me just enough space to throw a couple of elbows into his ribs. Moaning and holding his cracked side, he slackened his grip, finally allowing me to struggle free. I clambered to my feet, trying to learn how to breathe again, but still, he wasn't done. For he was already staggering to his feet. Cursing, I rushed forward. Just as he straightened, I grabbed him by the tattered ears and headbutted him viciously into the face. There was an explosion of blood and teeth, and he went down hard. Instantly, I was upon him. Straddling his prone form, I grabbed him by the hair and began to smash his head into the cracked pavement over and over again until nothing remained but red ruin. At last, he stopped his twisting and convulsing, and he lay still. Exhausted, I rolled free of him and lay upon my back, covered in a cold sweat and breathing hard. Once I had recovered, I stood and staggered over to the hellbound blade and scooped it up. Hello, old friend, I said, enjoying the feel of it in my hand. Did you miss me? If you did, I gave no sign as I stuffed it into my belt and quickly covered it with my ragged jacket. My body had mercifully started to heal. I checked my compass and carried on towards the west, eager to leave the rotting remains of the dead city behind. The rest of the journey through the city was uneventful, yet whether this was just my own paranoia or the lengthening shadows pulling on my frayed nerves, I had the distinct feeling my every movement was being tracked and followed. I only relaxed and breathed a sigh of relief, then the city's spires and broken towers were no more than a smudge on the darkening horizon. I was entering a kind of swampland now, stale water and stunned vegetation on either side of the broken asphalt road. I was hungry and incredibly thirsty, but since neither dehydration nor starvation could really harm me, I put them from my mind and doggedly stroll on. Soon it became too dark to travel and I hunkered down in the middle of the road, resigning myself to another night in the wilderness. Pulling my ragged jacket tight about me, I fell into a restless sleep. I awoke with the coming dawn, only to come face to face with a mangy-looking feline that sat close by, gnawing on the remains of a ragged-looking fish. Hey, you, uh, fancy sharing some of that? I remarked irritably, rubbing the sleep from my eyes. Even better. Go catch me one. Ha! Sorry, Lucifer replied, smiling at me from between needle-like teeth. I'm afraid this was the last fish in the whole stinking swamp. Yeah, it tastes all the better for it. Feeling the rigors of the wasteland, are you, Mr. Davis? Well, hopefully now you have the knife back and you can be about your business. The settlement you seek lies only a couple of miles along this very road. Mm. You couldn't have told me this yesterday and saved me another uncomfortable night on the road, I huffed. He chuckled then. Where would be the fun in that? Besides... This isn't a fucking Walt Disney epic. What would you have me do? Appear as a fluttering firefly to guide your dainty feet to your next destination? Give you a foot rub? Check your prostate, perhaps. I wonder, he said, cocking his head quizzically. If you could fit a full-sized cat into a human rectum. I stood up quickly. Just along this road, you said. The cat grinned wickedly. Yes, Mr. Davis. Just a couple of miles. We have to take care of something first. Now kneel, he commanded. I did as he bid, falling on my knees before him. Good. Now take the blade and open up your palm with it. Cut deep. I really want to see the blood flow. I did as he asked, wincing as the hellbound blade slid easily through the meat of my palm and the blood began to flow like a crimson waterfall. Lucifer's eyes lit up greedily, and he stalked forward, his tongue spittling, becoming serpent-like as he lapped greedily at the bleeding hand. Do you mind telling me what the fuck you're doing? I gasped through the pain, eager to be rid of his touch, but he ignored me, 
licking deeper and longer, his tongue probing the open wound. At last, he withdrew, sitting back on his haunches, a look of smug satisfaction on his face. All gone, he tittered. What? What's all gone? I asked, checking myself over. That annoying little aura of yours. That last vestige of hell that clings to your forsaken soul. This is a stealth mission, and that aura of yours is a dead giveaway. It's never been a problem before, I said, ripping at my shirt to make a makeshift bandage for my still bleeding hand. Indeed, he replied, but then again, you've never been offered up for sacrifice before now, have you? Sacrifice? I said in a strangled voice. What the hell are you talking about? Sacrifice? Follow the road, he said, scampering away. The settlement you seek is just over the next horizon. That said, he hurried away and soon vanished amongst the stunted growth, leaving me stood bewildered on the shattered highway, my stomach tied in tight knots. After a few deep breaths, I got my whirling emotions under control and I carried on along the road. After all, what choice did I really have? Besides, I thought to myself, Lucifer must have some kind of plan. It was far from his own best interest to leave me hanging out to dry. So I hurried onward, eager to leave this living hell that this world had become. The settlement itself was nothing more than a few crumbling buildings, flapping tents and rusting lean-tos. At my approach, an alarm was sounded and a bunch of ragged-looking men came on the run. Michael! Their leader scowled, stepping forward. The man was tall, skeletal frame, with hawk-like nose and watchful eyes. We thought you dead, he growled, a hint of disappointment in his voice. Not yet, I replied, not sure how to proceed. Show me then, he said, tearing the satchel from my shoulder. Thankfully, I had strapped the hellbound blade to my inner thigh with the ragged remains of my shirt, and the satchel was now blessedly empty. Yet somehow this seemed to please the big man who grinned at me shark-like from between rotting teeth. Oh, Michael, he shook his head with exaggerated sadness. What did I say would happen if you came back from the wastes empty-handed once again? Three days you've been gone and not so much as a lousy rat for the cooking pot. He nodded to the two sacrifice-looking men at his sides, who instantly surged forward, pinning my arms down to my sides. You're useless, Michael, and I have no use for useless people. You're going to the tribute, he whispered into my face. It was all I could do not to wince away from his fetid breath. And that pretty little woman of yours will be warming my bed before your bones are cold in the ground. When he got no reaction from this, he snarled, bringing his head crashing down into my upturned face. And for a little while... I knew no more. I awoke some time later, a gnarled hand pushing at my shoulder. Okay, okay, leave off, I croaked, sitting upright. I was in a cage with about six other people, two young girls and four other men, ranging from young to old. It was the old man still clawing at my shoulder as if he hadn't heard a word that I said. They're coming! He wheezed, coming for their tribute, coming for us. That's when I heard the roar of engines, deafening in the surrounding silence, as if the whole settlement was holding its collective breath. The sound of engines grew louder as a makeshift vehicle pulled into the settlement from the very direction I had just traveled. Great, I whispered, from the living dead to the motherfucking Thunderdome. More vehicles were arriving. Everything from open-top jeeps to large, canvas-covered trucks, blowing great plumes of smoke into the ash-filled air. From the lead vehicle, a leather-clad woman bounded forth, a makeshift spear clenched tight in her scarred, battered fist. She was a big woman, tall, raw-boned, with black mane-like hair flowing down her back. She smiled wickedly as the settlement's leader approached, revealing yellowed teeth filed down to sharp-looking points. At that smile, the approaching man faltered before continuing forward, bowing low. Ah, great lady, we are honored by your presence. The tribute awaits you, he said, his arms outstretched in a fawning gesture 
as he gently herded her towards myself and the rest of the terrified prisoners. A shabby looking lot, she said, glancing over the cowering mass, all except myself, who met her glance with one of my own. Well, 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 she said, bending low to give me a closer look. What a pretty little man you are. You don't look diseased, anyway. I have never been overly fussy. That's what I like about men. You can do a lot more with a man than simply eat him. If her comment was supposed to strike fear in me, it didn't work. But I feigned it anyway, dropping my eyes and faking a raking shudder. She laughed at this and stalked away, the settlement's head man hot on her heels. I have an announcement to make, she bellowed. I've found another settlement far to the east. This settlement is large and thriving and now belongs to me, and so I release you from your bondage. This place is dying. Hell, she said, glaring around. This place is already dead. You folks just don't have the good sense to lay still. Jonah, she commanded the headman who came forward. Tell me, what do you do with a chicken when it stops laying eggs? Before he could answer, she whipped a rust-covered machete from around her back and took his head with one foul swoop. For a moment, his body just stood there, spraying blood before it collapsed in a dusty heap at her booted feet. Round them up, she screamed at her men. There for the cooking pot, boys. The men let out a roar of excitement before giving chase to the fleeing crowd. It was over all too soon, as the denizens of the settlement were slaughtered in mass. Their bleeding, torn bodies loaded onto the truck like sides of beef. What are these? A bald man with a scarred and battered face asked, rapping on the side of the cage. Constance turned to face him. Keep the man and the two girls. They can go to the breathing pens. The man is mine. Slaughter the rest. The man grunted and signaled to two men who came on the run. The cage was thrown open and myself and the two crying girls were dragged out and shoved roughly towards the waiting trucks. From behind us came the screams of the dying as they were brutally dispatched. I didn't look back. Or even flinch. These people were not my problems. Only Constance and her imminent return to hell. We boarded the back of the truck and rode through the wasteland in the company of the dead. I was unsure just how long the journey lasted. I think at some point I may have simply drifted off. Either way, the sun was just starting to set in the west when the truck suddenly slowed, followed by a shouted command and the sound of a clinging gate. A voice was raised in greeting and the trucks lurched forward before coming to a complete halt. There are more raised voices and the echoes of coarse laughter before the back of the truck was flung open and we were herded outside. The Raider compound was very much like the settlement we had just left, only on a much larger scale. The only marked difference was a large, intact structure with a sheet metal roof. The faded picture of a pig wearing a chef's hat smiled obscenely from the building's flaking side. Not to worry, one man said, following my gaze. You're not for the grinder, my friend. <laughs> well, at least not yet. Constance wants to play with you a little first. Who knows? If you please her, you may yet live. Her last plaything lasted a whole week before she wore him out. Now take a seat, he said, shoving me down by the side of his truck. Constance will send for you when she's ready. And don't even think of running. Wouldn't dream of it. I smiled up at him. He must have seen something in that smile that he didn't like, and he scowled at me, before quickly turning away. I sat there for some time, the hellbound blade digging uncomfortably into the scant flesh of my thigh. The raiders hadn't bothered to search me, or anyone else for that matter, perhaps not seeing the ragged shelters as any kind of threat. That was fine by me. Like Lucifer said, this is all about the element of surprise. Sometime later, as darkness settled across the land, the same man from before dragged me to my feet. Come along, Prince Charming, he growled. Your new mistress is eager to see you. I let him lead me to the tent, set a little way back from the others before being rudely shoved inside. The tent was large and spacious, with glowing braziers and rug-covered floors. 
a table and chairs for eating. The rest of the room was dominated by a large double bed, chains ending in bloody handcuffs hung down from the corners of the splintered bedposts. She followed my gaze and smiled wantonly. Take a seat, she said, gesturing towards the bed. I did as she bid, knowing that I would have to end this thing soon before she decided to slap on the cuffs. She was slinking towards me, shedding bits of clothing as she came on. Suddenly she moved lightning fast, pinning me beneath her. The blade strapped to my leg erupted into searing flames at her presence, setting my meager clothing on fire, causing her to leap back in pain and confusion. Not wasting any time, I tore the blade free and leapt from the bed, but she had already moved with that same eerie speed, putting the table between us. So, you're one of his, she snarled. Lucifer's bitch. But you don't know what a true bitch really is. Come, let me show you. The transformation was almost instantaneous. One minute, a naked woman stood before me. The next, a huge, slobbering hellhound. The last thing I saw before she leapt at me, clamping her massive jaws around my neck, was the glow of her burning crimson eyes. And suddenly, I was falling. I landed in Lucifer's great hall in a sprawling heap, only to be grabbed up like a rag doll and smashed into the midnight blackened walls. How dared you fail me? The Dark Lord screeched, crushing my throat with a hand grown talon-like and twisted. I had seen him angry before, but nothing like this. His rage was suffocating, all-consuming. You're going back! He screamed at me from between razor-like teeth. You're going back, and you're going to break it for me. Do you understand? He said, shaking me back and forth, but I didn't understand. Break what? I managed to gasp through his crushing embrace. Something slid between his eyes, and he cast me away from him. Go back, he said, seeming to regain a little composure. Go back there and kill that bitch. Give me what is mine. He clicked his fingers, and a fiery portal opened beneath me. Once again, I was falling. I awoke naked and suspended in midair, stifling a scream against the razor-sharp hooks embedded in my back. To my left and right hung similar corpses, strung up like sides of beef, some of them missing arms and legs, others gutted and cleaned out. I, myself, was mostly intact, and I surmised not much time had passed since Constant had bested me. A knife, I muttered. What the hell has she done with a knife? The corpse by my side suddenly turned its head and grinned at me. Who said you needed the knife in the first place, it croaked. Do you ever consider that it was merely a conduit for your own power? Is it? I asked, never even considering such a thing. No, fuckwit, the corpse grinned at me. You're fucking useless. Get the blade back and finish that bitch. Damn, that is real funny, asshole, I growled. But I was only talking to a dead man. All life fled. All right, I said, raising my knees to my chest. Let's get this shit done with. With a cry, I thrust my legs down with all of my might. Again and again, feeling the hooks tear and slide through my flesh until at last, ah, I was free. I knelt on the cold stone floor, lost in agony until finally my wounds began to knit and heal. I stood then and made my way over to the door, which was mercifully unlocked before peering outside. It was full dark now, and only a few smoldering campfires remained, surrounded by snoring men, the sharp tang of homemade hooch, and roasting meat perfumed the air. Heading forward, I slinked into the night, keeping a wary eye out for any roaming guards, but there was nothing. These raiders considered themselves the apex predator of the wasteland. Why bother with guards? I mean, who in their right mind would dare to attack them? Sticking to the shadows, I made my way towards Constance's tent. There was a guard here. The man was asleep. Dead drunk like the rest of the motley crew. He was laying on his side, his arms wrapped around a makeshift spear, hugging it close like some deadly teddy bear. Squatting down on my haunches, I crept closer until I loomed above him. Then, gently, oh so gently, I slid his knife from its sheath. Clamping a hard hand over his mouth, I thrust the knife deep into the side of his neck. He kicked a little bit and bled a lot, but it was soon over. 
I sat there for some time listening for the slightest noise or cry of alarm, but there was nothing. Only the sound of a stirring ash on the night wind. Standing, I took a firm grip on the bloody knife, and I slipped around the back of the tent. Only a single light bulb burned inside, and I prayed that Constance, believing me vanquished, had retired for the evening. The knife has to be inside, I considered. No way she could have touched it. Taking a deep breath, I sliced the canvas and slid inside. Constance was sat at her table, grinning at me. The hellbound blade sat atop the table between us. I noticed the rough bandage on her hand. I returned her smile with one of my own. Tried to wield it, did you? Guess you learned the hard way. It only serves one master. She ignored that. I knew you would return. Lucifer is nothing if not persistent. I shrugged, edging towards the table. He wants you back in hell where you belong. And where do you belong? She fired back at me. Do you think Lucifer will send you straight up to heaven when this is all over? Did you even consider why he doesn't collect these wayward souls of his himself? The question caught me off guard. And that's when she made her move, leaping across the table at me, transforming into the giant hound as she came. But this time I was ready for her. Instead of leaping away, I leapt forward, diving under the table, popping up like a jack-in-the-box on the other side. I grabbed the hellbound blade just as she turned and launched herself at me once again. Swinging wildly, I slashed the side of her foaming muzzle. She leapt away, howling as her torn flesh began to smoke and char. I laughed at her as she began to backpedal out of the torn tent. Now, I said, weaving the burning blade at her, you are royally... Fucked. Her nerve broke and she turned and fled into the night. There was a sudden commotion, then another great howl of pain. I heard from the tent, dagger raised and just suddenly stopped before bursting into laughter. Constance's own men, woken by the commotion, had come on the run only to see a great feral beast covered in blood flee from their mistress's tent. Enraged, they fell upon her, stabbing and kicking, piercing her sides with makeshift spears and sharpened staves until at last, weakened and no longer able to hold on to her terrible transformation, she reverted back to her more human state. I will kill all of you for this, she spat at them. And I'll help her, I bluffed, raising the burning blade. That was enough for this rabble. Fearing their mistress' wrath and seeing a dead man come back to life, they fled screaming into the night. I stalked over to Constance, who was now trying to crawl away, leaving a bloody trail behind her. I stomped down on her back, driving her down into the dirt before grabbing a handful of her matted hair and placing the blade at her neck. Have you ever considered, I grated at her, that it's better to serve in hell than to reign in heaven? I didn't wait for her reply, but sliced her neck with precise ease. And once again, I was back in Lucifer's great hall. Well, well, well. Finally got the job done, did we, Mr. Davis? Real tough bitch, that one. He beamed down at me from his golden throne. In every way imaginable, I turned to face him, bowing low. Four down, one to go. Tell me, are you by any chance a fan of Eastwood, or how about John Wayne? <laughs> he chuckled. I think I'm beginning to sense a theme, I sighed. Are you indeed? He laughed, slapping at his thigh before clicking his fingers and summoning another fiery portal. Well, he said with an evil glint in his eye. What are you waiting for? Hi-ho, Silver! Away! Turning from him. I headed for the portal, wanting nothing more than to put an end to this madness. Yeah, I said. Giddy up, cowboy. And step through. Hey there, kids, it's me. Mr. Cube Pasta, I want to tell you thank you so much for watching today's video on YouTube or listening to today's episode of the podcast on the podcast. 
tonight, I'm going to let you know about a couple of authors that I really love their work of, and I think all of you have too. Usually in my live streams, you guys will tell me some of your favorite stories, but these ones constantly show up, and I feel like a lot of you don't know that there's actual novels that continue on from the stories that you just hear on YouTube. And in some cases, I even do the audiobooks for them that you can find on Audible. Three of which I want to let you know about right now. The Neverglades, Volume 1, Volume 2, and Volume 3 are available right now on Amazon, both on Kindle and on paperback. And My Tiny Town Just Got Put on Lockdown is available on Amazon as one major novel that contains both Season 1 and Season 2, which is not done on the channel yet, as well as a brand new one called The Study, an Effluvium Hayes novel, which continues the story of My Tiny Town Just Got Put on Lockdown. And of course, I think one of everybody's favorite series is on here, Tales from the Gas Station, currently has a fourth volume that has just come out. I did the audio books for volume one through three. Four will come out eventually. So without further ado, I want to give a very big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Tanya Oren, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Kraus, That One Guy, Lupita Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Tyler Fletcher, Rebecca Harper, Murky Moo, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier the Cheyenne, Demix, Sean Caddo Baker, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Rob Like Sharp Things, Chaos Art, Cryolinian, Milk and Meal, Zachary Grafius, Gorang Tramagasi, Maria Walker, Pain Gravy, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Aka Limchop, Dirt Diver, Matt Bach, Jabbles Raz, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Matthew McNeese, Shelly J, Jeremy H, Raltazal, Ficomel, Nana, Nick Weaver, Deleted Account, Melted Lake, Holly Sue, Guy Mara Ravenswood, William King, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Nessie, Ronnie Hansen, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Sashi Suzaku, Croconut 509, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Trickin, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Nicholas Zaccardi, Happy Birthday, Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester's Lamb Shade, Guy Harbor, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. As always, thank you guys so very, very much. Thank all of you who are in the description down below, and honestly, thank all of you that can give anything, even when it comes down to just $1. I appreciate you guys very, very much. Sweet dreams.